Hey, good day, friends. I'm here with uh, Rick Haney. We're outside of uh, Washington, Iowa. It's been a tremendous field day. Uh, Mitchell Hora and his team from Continuing to Continuum Ag has put together a, a really great day. We've had you, Rick, but we've had uh, Russell Hedrick, Rick Clark, um, just a handful of awesome folks telling us about soil health, sharing their experiences. Um, so I just wondered if you could share a little bit about the Haney test that you created. Tell us, give us an overview of it, I guess. Well, that, that test was, is, it happened over a number of years. It actually started graduate school in about 1996. And okay. we were trying to look at uh, this respiration from soil. You mm -hmm. know, microbes take in oxygen and give off CO2 just like we do. Right. And we were <clears throat> realizing that, wait a minute, this is actually related to the fertility of this soil. Mm -hmm. Like if you had soil, so we tested a bunch of soils way back then that had higher organic matter. Mm -hmm. And we noticed their CO2 re release First, yeah. was higher also. Sure. In, in almost in a linear fashion, and that was eye-opening. Oh, and yeah. we thought we were going to, you know, change the world with that test, you know, twenty some years ago. Right. And here we are, you know, twenty some years later, right. and now it's starting to catch. You know, sure. now it's starting to. And the biggest thing I think that that is important to understand is that, you know, our soils are alive, mm -hmm. and we've never really treated them like they were. They, sure. We've treated them like it's just this dead, dirt that dead we, dirt. yeah, we drive on, and we might plant crops in it or whatever. Right. <clears throat> that's just as far from the truth as it can get. It's a living entity. Yeah. And so that's a whole new mindset. And, and, the, and the standard tests that we've had before uh, have never taken really any of that into account because they were developed so long ago. Sure. And what they were more interested in was nutrients. You know, how much N, P, and K does it take mm -hmm. to grow uh, this bushel of corn or wheat or whatever, yep. which is completely understandable. And, but, but this is the fun part. During my uh, PhD dissertation, I did a lot of looking at old references. Mm. And it was over a hundred years ago that these guys, these soil scientists and from all over the world were looking at uh, CO2 respiration. Mm. They were looking at uh, water extractable carbon. Nice. They were looking at all these different things that just kind of got lost. Mm. Why? Because we, you know, here's the invention after World War II of fertilizer. For sure. Came on the scene. Came on the scene. You know, oh, we're getting these big yields based on this fertilizer. So the whole thing just kind of went off the rails. Ah. Now, so when I when I write my dissertation, I'm referencing all these papers from 1910, 1895. Yeah. <laughs> this one guy from Russia was uh, in 1903 to 1930s. They were really looking at water as an extractant, and I thought, oh my God. Right. And so, <clears throat> you know, we were doing. I started doing water ex extracts because we were doing carbon extracts of soil using something called potassium sulfate, which is just this chemical we have available to us. Yep. And I started noticing that when the pH of the soil changed, we were getting more carbon out with water, mm -hmm. potassium sulfate. And it's like, Ooh, wait a minute, how can that be? Right. And so slowly but surely, it finally dawned on me that why are we not using water as an extractant? Because mm -hmm. that's what it rains. Right. Yeah. That's soil, nature system. Nature system. So the whole thing started to morph into how does nature see this? Mm -hmm. How does nature see what we're doing? Right. And why can't we see the soil from nature's perspective? Uh, Are we helping it by putting on highly salted fertilizers and, and a high concentration of fertilizers? Sure. Is that how nature works? And the answer is no. Right. So I started going through all these questions and answers. Is this how nature does it? No. So soil testing, I, I thought, was a, an avenue that we could really have an impact on farmers and maybe help their bottom line because I watched mm -hmm. them struggle. All those guys I used to work for, I watched them struggle for years. You know, they'd borrow a million dollars and, 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 and buy, buy seed and animals that could die. Right. And I don't know how they dealt with that kind of stress. Oh, tremendous and so stress. So I really wanted to help them in some way, and soil testing seemed to be an avenue once I got into grad school. Yeah, and it's been an awesome tool. I mean, we, we talked a lot about it here today at the field. Um, so you talked a little bit about the using water as an extract. What Compare that a little bit to the conventional soil test. What is that used for an extract? Well, they use a variety of extracts. Mm -hmm. uh, potassium chloride is one that they use for nitrogen. And, yep. and you can use water. I mean, it gets nitrate nitrogen. It doesn't really matter if you use KCL or water. I mean, you right. should get the same. It's water soluble. So, you know, but, but there's a seven or eight different extractants out there that give you seven or eight different numbers sure. for phosphate and potassium and, and all kinds of things. And that just seemed like it was all over the board. Sure. And I, I thought, well, how does nature do it? You know, and so I, I developed a, an extractant uh, that was based on what plant roots used. So they use organic acids and drop them out of the, of 
their plant roots into the surrounding soil area yep. and solubilize nutrients. And I thought, well, why can't we make an extractant mm -hmm. based on that? Sure. So I did a bunch of research reading and, and, and picked out the three most predominant uh, organic acids that, uh, across a bunch of plant bases that they use okay. and stuck them in there. Now, it took me four or five years. To get that honed in. Yeah. There were four different versions. <laughs> wow. I call it H31, H32, H33, and H3. A4 yep. and so finally ended up with the, with the right one and, and, and did some pretty good research got papers out on it that it's like that yeah, there it is so awesome. but awesome. but it was not an overnight thing yeah, yeah. It took years is what you're saying well and you could have spent you could spend several careers uh, trying to find a soil extractant that really mimics nature sure because it's way more complex than we understand I tried to just make it simple and here we go yeah awesome and so the Haney test <coughs> soil health test gives a score um, but I don't know, can you tell us a little bit about how farmers are utilizing the test? How are they saving money by utilizing it? Well, they're, us they're using it in two ways. And, what, and one way is that we're finding, uh, we actually measure the total nitrogen pool in a water extract, mm -hmm. which contains inorganic and organic nitrogen. Correct. So we also, so we take one sample, run it through that machine for total nitrogen. We take the same sample and run it for inorganic nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So the difference between those two is organic nitrogen, Correct. which we've never measured. And never, soil test doesn't, doesn't measure. Doesn't measure that. Yep, right. And so for years they struggled to find a test to, to for nitrogen mineralization, meaning what how much nitrogen does the soil give up mm -hmm. naturally. And it never really got to an answer. And then when this machine came out that would measure that, it's like there it is. Bingo. Yeah. Yeah. And that that hit me. And so I guess I was the first one to really utilize that machine that way. Sure. And I was so excited and <laughs> and, and it has turned out that, you know, you're you're looking at twenty anywhere from 15 to $30 an acre savings uh, in nitrogen just from that little test right there right. per acre. Right, so. but it also looks at you know potassium, you know phosphate, yep. all that as well, so that yep. we're able to take credit for essentially the, the biologically available nutrients that the previous tests aren't able to pick up. Well, they, they don't pick them up because they weren't designed to pick them up. Right. You know? so it, and yeah. you know, there's a couple of different machines you can use, and we use both those machines for phosphate, uh, and so we have a little nice cross checks Sure. To make sure that everything looks right, you know, yeah. it, it was it was an evolution of, of integration of the data to 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 let the soil speak to us, right. and that was that's the biggest difference I think is that we've always thought well we'll get this soil set in in the lab we'll throw all this chemistry at it and and decide this is what it means well how about if we just do a more passive system mm -hmm. and let it talk to us sure. and tell us what's going on. That seemed yeah. to be a better approach because nature's yeah. been at this research and development a little bit longer than we have. For sure, for sure. And I guess the question is, is are we willing to listen <laughs> to what nature's telling that us? That is I mean, the big question. I think that's question. pretty important, you know, when we're trying to get into soil health and change how we're thinking and farming. You know? Well, and that's so. a very different approach to let, let's dominate this soil and make it do what we want to. Let's listen to it for once and see what it has to tell us because it, yeah. it, it's trying to teach us every day. And right. as you said, if we don't listen, what have we what have we done right right um, I guess just a couple other questions or thoughts you know so I sometimes hear people say that it's not calibrated for my soil or the university folks will kind of balk at that mm -hmm. or bring that point up how can you address that well the university calibration uh, test I, I've asked a whole lot of them for their calibration data which they never seem to come up with which yeah. is interesting but you know I'm not saying they don't have it but they don't want to share it for whatever reason but yeah. but those tests were calibrated to nitrogen, you know, fertilizer response curves by and large. I don't, I don't really care about that. What we were trying to account for with this test is that if you could grow 100 bushel corn in Iowa with no, no fertilizer, mm -hmm. we want to identify that. Sure. That's what we're after. Mm -hmm. So as far as calibration, we tried to calibrate this test to account for the no fertilizer plot, mm -hmm. the control plot. That's, right. We want to account for the stuff that nature gives up naturally and, and then we'll supplement with the other. Sure. Instead of the other way around, let's just put it all out and forget what nature gives us. Right. That's a very different yeah, different, different lens system. for sure. It is. Yeah. Right, right. So I guess maybe just to kind of wrap up, so it looks like we're talking about looking at our soils kind of as more of a, a dynamic system that's kind of has lots of moving parts, it's ever changing compared to maybe an older way of looking at it would be more of a static or kind of a locked in. Can you address yeah. that just briefly? Yeah, and that's <clears throat> that's a really interesting point because we I've had a farmer and he had sent me a, a sample in the spring and a sample in the fall. Okay. And, and he called me and he said, oh my God, these, these numbers are different. He was all upset. Mm -hmm. I said, thank God. 
And he was like, what? what you? I said, look, we're, we're not measuring a static system now. We're measuring, we're measuring microbial activity. We're measuring food source. We're measuring C to N ratio and balance. You know, we're, we're measuring a dynamic system now. We hope it changes. It better. But yeah, what we want, what we want it to do is change, but we can't, we've used static thinking and static tests to measure mm -hmm. dynamic systems that's not gonna work. Right. So we had to come up with a more dynamic system and we're just gonna have to get our heads around it. <laughs> Right. Now, when they came out with the standard soil test 40, 50, 60 years ago, whenever it was, do you think that when they broke out there that there was some resistance? And yeah, well, of course there was. Right. And you, you know, had similar problems. Yeah. So we're in, you know, we're in the beginning stages of looking at this different. So it's going to take a little time to, to gain acceptance and understand. But, you know, try to tell me what the soil health is from a standard test. Yeah, can't you do you that. can't do it. Right. Not because it's all bad. It's because it wasn't designed to do that. This sure. test was designed to do that from the beginning. Right. And we right. still measure nitrate, nitrogen, yeah. ammonium, mm -hmm. orthophosphate, just like the standard test does. But then in addition, we do these other things. Right, right. And I think it's become an awesome tool. I mean, I've worked with plenty of farmers that are really thankful for it. I mean, they're thankful for you, and you, you probably hear that. Um, I guess just to maybe kind of wrap up, where if somebody wants to find out more information about the Haney test, you know, there's private you know, com companies and labs doing it, but where else could they find some, you know, general information about it if they wanted? Well, it, it's going to be everywhere, you know, the same place we order everything, you know, okay. Google it. Yep, <laughs> yeah, sure, right. right. Uh, but, I mean, can they go to ARS, the, you know, egg research There's group? not so much on that. You okay. know, it's been kind of a strange uh, a thing. Uh, you know, we tried to build a website about, you know, and it met some resistance with that. Sure. And I, I never really understood that, but... Anyway, there's there's plenty of information out there. Okay. Email me before the uh, June thirtieth, and uh, before he I, retires, and I'll send it. Uh, send what I have to you. Sure. We yeah. have a little PDF. Uh, yeah, I've got. I've yeah. seen that before. If yeah. anybody wants, you know, they could get a hold of you, and you can you could send uh, that to sure. them. Sure. Because yeah. that that's a good little uh, explanation of what the test is and get people started. Yeah. Now here's the fun part. We did all these samples over forty five thousand over ten years through our little lab, mm -hmm. and. People would call and say, well, I don't understand this test. And you, it's like, we always sent that PDF file out. Did you read the Did PDF? you read? No. <laughs> <laughs> so why did we send it so to you? So this is what I would do. Yeah. Read that, call me that, back. Sure. That took care of probably 90% yes, of it. Yes, it did. That was, that was really funny because <laughs> that's just our nature, right? Because right. we're one-click Amazon everything, you know? And yeah. so we, it's like, what does this mean? Right. Well, let's study. Right. I, Educate I, yourself. I want farmers, and I know they're, they're time limited, just like all of us, but... The soil is your craft. It's your it's your it's your tool. You know, yeah. know your. When you take a combine to the field, which you know I've done for many years, I know how it works. And if it breaks, I can fix it. Right. Well, guess what? Farmers should look at their soil the same way. It's right. their machine. It's their tool. It's a living thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, isn't that how they treat their cattle? Right. You know, that's a living entity. So, right. if they would study their soil, uh, it it'll pay benefits. Right. Right. So focus in not just on the above ground, the crops, but really the underground herd, all the biology. Yep. Fungi. I mean, that's, that's what I think you're saying. So. Well, and one last thing I would say is that a lot of folks are really worried about yield drag when mm -hmm. they get into a, a, go from a conventional system to a, a no-till system or something like that or yep. cover crops. And I, I wanted to think about this, that you have farmed the microbial community you have. Mm. Created by your, it basically. Yes, by your management. Yeah. If you switch your management, you're gonna bring another team in mm. and it might take a little transition time and you might see a little yield drag, but guess what? You're bringing the A team in, uh, not the B team. So here yeah. we go. So just, if you can be patient and hang in sure. there. I know a lot of farmers have a lot of rented land and you don't, you gotta have landlords on board. Sure. You know, there's just so many issues, but right. boy, if you're really interested in this, I had a farmer just today, he said, man, I am so excited about farming. And I said, how yeah. long have you been farming? He said, about 30 years. <laughs> And he said, I was about to give up several times. And he said, in the last five years since we started this no-till and using these cover crops, and he said, I still commissioned till some stuff. And I said, you use cover crops? He said, yeah. I said, there you go. Awesome. He said, this is fun again. And right. I said, oh, my God, that's what I want to hear. Right. That, that's right. music to my ears. Right, right. Awesome. Well, I think that kind of wraps it up. I appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. And uh, appreciate you guys checking us out. If you like our videos, give us a, a thumbs up, <laughs> and we'll uh, catch you on the next one. Thanks, all.